Hello and welcome to the European Conservatives Brussels headquarters. And joining us from Vienna today is Ralf Scholhammer, an assistant professor of international relations at the Webster University, a regular writer and contributor of over a dozen journals, including the Washington Examiner, the Wall Street Journal, and the Unheard, and also the host of the 1020 podcast. Rolf, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. But the reason that we've contacted you and want, wanted this interview is that you're also the author of a recent report you wrote from the, for the MCC Brussels about um, nuclear energy titled Why We Need Nuclear Towards the Future of Plenty. Well, this is a, a catchy title. So this is what we're going to discuss today. And, um, but, but first, let me um, ask you to kind of introduce yourself especially that you're a political scientist. So what, um, in this way, what gets you hooked into this entire energy story and particularly nuclear? Well, thanks so much for asking. I think that's a very good question and an important one because hopefully it will keep anybody who's listening to this and watching it from fleeing. So don't worry, we're not gonna talk about the, the technical details of nuclear fission and nuclear uh, fusion. We're gonna talk why it is an important thing for the prosperity of everyone who's listening to this, right? Why energy is an, imp is an important element. And as you just said, I come from a political science background. I also have a training as an economist, but I'm not an engineer. Um, so what brought me to the matter of energy was the very question, kind of what makes human life, what makes human societies, what makes political development possible in the first place, right? You know this question, like we always hear these debates, what's the most important invention, what's the most important thing? And some people say it's language, it's writing, it's all these different things. And I think there is something to it. But I would go, if you allow me to, I would go a step further and really reach back into the realm of myth. Like everyone, particularly those of a conservative pent, I assume, know Greek mythology. You know, everybody knows the story of Prometheus, right? Prometheus, kind of, he stole the fire, he stole the flame and gave it to humans. And, you know, he was, of course, punished by Zeus for this. The gods were very upset about it. And we say, well, this stands for uh, the human scientific endeavor. It stands for the human will to discover for science. Okay, I like that interpretation. I have no problem with that. But you could say it, it's more basic. So what did Prometheus give to humanity? fire, the flame. Now you could say basically what he did, and being a little bit facetious here, but he gave humanity the first combustion engine, right? Burning wood. That's the first combustion engine. He gave humanity kind of the first form, the most rudimentary form of energy, which is fire, right? Which is the production of heat through burning wood. And I would say that in many ways, energy really is the core through which we can understand human society and human development, because without energy, nothing gets done. And I promise, I'm, I tend to monologue, so please everybody bear with me, but I think this is such an important way. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a very short story, but I think that short story will make clear for everyone who listens to this why energy is important. Imagine yourself, you wake up 250,000 years ago, hunter-gatherer. So you go out, you stroll through the woods collecting berries. Now, you better hope that the handful of berries you collect at the end of the day have at least as much energy as you had to waste, right, has, have as many calories as you had to burn looking for them. Because otherwise, you're gonna be in a significant calorie deficit, which might be fun if you wanna get lean, but if you do it for too long, you're gonna die. Now imagine that you come up with an idea and say, you know what, instead of walking all day through the forest looking for berries, I'm gonna build a little trap. And in that little trap, you might catch a rabbit. Now maybe building that trap took as much energy as those berries gave you. But that rabbit is going to give you much more energy than the, the energy that you invested. So you're going to have more power for future endeavors. And now say, like you're now bulked up on rabbit, you feel stronger. So you say you can use that additional energy that you have in your body. You build an even bigger trap and let's say you catch a mammoth. Right? A mammoth is going to provide you with calories, it's going to provide you with energy, not just for a day, not just for a week, maybe for a month. Maybe not just you, maybe it will provide your family, your entire tribe. Which means you take away their obligation, for example, to go out collecting berries, to find energy, so to speak, to find calories, because you've got it in that caught mammoth. So what you then can do is you can use that time that has been freed up to do other things, to make you know, cave paintings, to, uh, to develop 
a written language, to do all the things that we would call you know, the foundations of civilization. But it goes back to the matter of energy, because we can't do anything without energy. And why is this important? And I know we're going to get into more details about this, but I really kind of want to, to talk about this at the very beginning. The concept is that every kind of energy that we harness needs energy to be invested up front. So if we take, for example, renewables, solar, wind, usually the amount of energy you get back is three, maybe four or five times, right? For every unit of energy you invest, you get three, four or five times the energy back. Fossil fuels, it's about 30 times. With nuclear, it's 100 times. So for every unit of energy you invest, so to speak, that you use to build a nuclear, the energy you need to build a nuclear power plant, in a very short amount of time, that nuclear power plant is going to give you 100 times that energy back, right? which means that you have more time, more force, more labor at your, available, at your availability to do other things. And what I'm afraid of, and now we come to the fact why I'm interested in this as a political scientist and an economist, I think what we do in Europe we kind of want to move back. So we want to move back from the mammoth to the rabbit, to the berries. And we tell the people, oh, you don't worry. Right? Those berries are much cheaper or they are much more nutritious. So at the end, everything is going to be fine and much better. No, it won't, right? Because the, the key point is always the same, that once we have to invest more and more and more energy to get just slightly more energy out of it on the long run. So we, we invest more and more, but don't really get significantly more out of our investments. So the, the energy return on energy investment is getting ever smaller. Well, we have to make up for the difference. So this means we won't have time to do other things. We won't have energy to do other things. And what this means is that ultimately we're gonna get poorer. So this is in a, in a nutshell, right? Why energy is so fundamentally important. We do very often, also in modern economics, we treat things like oil, like gas, like uranium like it's any other commodity, like it's any other thing, like it's an iPad or a, or a, you know, a bicycle helmet. But that is not true, because the energy contained in these fuels, whatever they might be, right, enable us to produce all these other things. And I think this is an awareness that is so important that I cannot stress this enough. We have to create a new awareness among the people that everything comes from somewhere, right? It's, it's not as if things are just there. Let me give you one last example. When you go to the store and you buy a gallon of milk, right? you might say, oh, it's a gallon of milk, decent price, acceptable price. But why is milk, for example, affordable at such rates? Well, because you don't have individual people, as, uh, unless in some cases, right, when it's organic, which is also why it's so much more expensive, that sit there and milk the cows by hand. right? We have massive milking machines, so we do it 400 times more efficient. So if I can milk cows, 400 times more efficient than if I would be doing it by hand. Well, of course, the price for the gallon of milk is falling significantly. But what do these machines need? They need energy. So if, hypothetically, right, the price of electricity doubles, triples, quadruples, well, of course, then I have two options. I can either say I also double, triple, quadruple the price of milk because my machines still need the energy, or I go back to everybody milking cows by hand, which could also work, but then, of course, you'll have significantly less milk and you have significantly less supply of other agricultural goods. So energy is in everything. There is nothing without energy. And any kind of policy, any kind of political approach that tries to reduce the available energy will ultimately lead to a decline in prosperity, to a decline in well-being. I have more to say about this, but I'll, I'll get back to it. Well, I think you laid out the entire discussion in, in about two minutes. but. Now we're going to go in and sort of dissect all of these things that you just said, because I think there's plenty more to say. So first, I think it's, you know, it's undoubtable that there is a campaign against nuclear energy. And sort of, it, it looks like it originates from social fear yes. of nuclear energy. I'm not sure if the fear was first or the propaganda was first, but... Um, let me start with a bit of pop culture. Go on. Because it's, it's very relevant. Did you see Oppenheimer? Uh, did I did. You? Yes, yes. But uh, for, for those viewers who didn't, you can, you can imagine what it's about. It's the birth of the first atomic bomb and the dawn of the nuclear era. And, and the movie uses a lot of stunning but apocalyptic imagery. And while I was watching it, knowing full well that it's about a bomb, I, I realized that there's many people, if not most, 
who associate these kind of imagery with the entire technology, including nuclear power plants. So, what do you think, even after 80 years, these, uh, these views, these fears about nuclear energy persist? Because uh, I think as many of our viewers and I suspect there's a lot more uh, to do with this in politics mm -hmm. than in science. Oh, yes. Um, let me give you a twofold answer to this. The one is because I think the, exp the example of the bomb is a particularly good one. Um, in a certain sense, right, war is nothing but the application of energy in many ways, just in a destructive form. And this is probably, in, in a devastating way, best exemplified in nuclear power. Right? It can be the most destructive weapon you know, we can imagine. But at the same time, of course, it used, or if the technology or the idea behind the technology, maybe let's put it this way, is used differently, it can be truly miraculous. And I would wager, right, and we can never run this experiment, but let's say nuclear fission would be discovered today. Right? Everything is like it is. And you know, we have to, to, what everyone thinks about the climate crisis, we can have a separate conversation about this. But let's say really the drive is towards uh, carbon-free or as much, uh, emissions-free electricity production as possible. And then somebody would say, we found something, it's called fission. We would hail it as a miracle and the entire world would go behind it Manhattan style, you know, Manhattan Project style to build as much nuclear power as possible. Just to kind of to, to exemplify this. The other thing is um, the and, and, and a nuclear power plant is not like a nuclear bomb waiting to go off. I think this is one of these miscomprehensions very often, as you correctly point out, in the public imagination that a nuclear power plant basically is like a nuclear bomb and it's just a matter of time until it goes off, right? It's just a matter of time until, until it's going to explode and until, uh, you know, the catastrophe will unfold. But as a matter of fact, compared to pretty much all other forms of energy slash electricity production, because it's still mostly electricity production, although advanced nuclear reactors, I think that's also very important to mention, uh, have capacities that go beyond the pure production of electricity. But if we stick with this example for a second, um, is the safest form of, of electricity production we have. Now, already I can in my inner ear, I can hear people watching this and saying, oh, how can he say this? What about Fukushima? What about Chernobyl? And what about I, the Three Mile Island? What about Three Mile Island? Yes. And I, I, I would basically, I would put out a bet, right? I'd be willing to bet a million dollars, right? Uh, if, if, if you can show me that uh, more than 100 people died all taken all together from any of those incidents. Uh, in Three Mile Island, I think the worst outcome was a couple of people got a radiation dose that was similar to a couple of x-rays. Uh, in Fukushima, it's debated. One person died seven years later. The assumption is that this person developed cancer as a consequence of the radiation from Fukushima, but that is debated because that's very hard to say seven years later. So we have a death toll, if at all, of one in Fukushima. And this is again the misleading thing. When people talk about Fukushima, it says the tsunami in Fukushima had 18,000 deaths. That is true. But that was the tsunami, right? That was not the nuclear power plant. So there was no massive radiation fallout that killed 18,000 people. There maybe was one that killed one. And Chernobyl, like in Chernobyl, the UN has tried very hard to come up with the correct numbers, how many people were killed directly by the, the, the nuclear incident in Chernobyl. And if you would go to the upper end, right, we, we go to 150, 200, but that's already really trying to kind of integrate as many potential negative side effects from this as possible. Directly affected were less than 100. Uh, and a tidbit that I always like to tell that I'm sure, again, our viewers will, will enjoy very much. Chernobyl continued to produce electricity until the year 2000. So it was not that they turned and shut everything down. It, it continued to produce electricity until the year 2000. And it was after long negotiations with the European Union that they basically paid Ukraine to turn off the nuclear power plant. Otherwise, it would probably have continued significantly longer. So even the worst incidents in nuclear power right, were not as bad as, for example, if we want to look this up, right, dam breaks we had in the past. Like in the 70s, uh, a hydro dam broke in China. Uh, estimates about people's killed range between 26 uh, and 240,000. We didn't stop building, building dams because of that, right? Because we assume that a dam built in Germany 
will be different from a dam built in China. And the same is true in nuclear energy as well. A nuclear power plant built in Germany, I think we can safely assume, is different from a nuclear power plant being built in Pakistan, being built in China, or even being built in Japan. I'm not saying that they're necessarily better, although as a footnote, the German nuclear power plants that were built in the 70s and 80s were the best the world has ever seen. So turning them off, and I'm sure a topic we're going to get to, turning them off for no reason except ideology whatsoever uh, was a crime against humanity. Yes, definitely. We'll get, we'll get back to Germany. But as long as we're here at uh, safety issues, the myths and reality of nuclear power, uh, what about nuclear waste? Because that's the other major point of concern of many, many people. Where to put the waste, where to store it. People think there's enormous amount of waste that radioactive waste that uh, nuclear power generation creates and also there's there's a problem of uh, radioactive treated water that these uh, reactors use yes are, are, are these things not uh, a point of concern no to you? it's propaganda I, 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 I I'm usually very careful using such harsh terms but it's propaganda and if you if you think that nuclear waste is a problem, you're either actively dealing in propaganda or you're a victim of propaganda. That, those are the only two solutions. There has been, and I was looking very hard, I was talking to people from the industry, I was desperately looking to find someone, I'm exaggerating slightly, but actually this is what I asked them. Can you find me a person who dropped you know, a nuclear waste canister on their foot and broke a leg that I can find something resembling a human casualty because of human waste? Because there is none. Not a single person, not a single person, there's no, not a single documented case. And I'm pretty sure if there would be, the anti-nuclear crowd would be all over it. There's not a single documented case about any person coming to harm because of nuclear waste. Nuclear waste is, based on newer reactor technologies, probably something that can be used as fuel in future reactors. And by sheer amount, uh, I think all the nuclear waste in the United States from their nuclear power plants would fit on a football field. Uh, and the way that they are stored, the cask in which they are stored, you can literally fly an airplane into it and it would have no effect. And another thing that people forget is radiation over time is being reduced. Other things, toxic materials, they remain toxic for the entirety of their existence. And this brings me back to something uh, that I really, really want to stress, the, the point I made before. We tend to forget where things come from. I would uh, implore people, <coughs> pardon me, the emotions are getting the better part of me. Look at mining. Uh, look at at at, at um, uh, uh, coal power plants. Like all of these activities, when when human beings wrestle something away from the earth, it has downsides. And I'm not I'm not saying that nuclear power is perfect. Everything is a trade-off. There is always <coughs> an upside and a downside. But I think in comparison to the alternatives, the trade-off when it comes to nuclear is one of the best we have. Just. Just last week, there, there were headlines all over that Japan is finally releasing the radioactive treated water into the ocean. There was something like a panic across the internet. What's the deal with this, this, this water that, uh, that is coming out of the reactors? Well, let me put it this way. Um, I was flying to Brussels from Vienna. Um, the kind of radiation I was exposed to on my trip from Vienna to Brussels would be more than I if uh, I would be drinking eight gallons of the Fukushima water that they are releasing over a few decades into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the, this is probably this water is so clean. It's it's not just drinkable. I mean, it probably would be tasteless because it is so clean. Uh, the radiation level is lower than that of a banana or a glass of beer. So if after this interview the two of us go out for a you know a banana split and and a pint. Uh, we expose ourselves to more radiation uh, than the Pacific Ocean will be by the Japanese Fukushima water re-released into the, into the ocean. And that's the other thing. Radiation is everywhere. We, we, we are constantly experiencing radiation. We do x-rays, as that we eat, some of us at least do, we eat bananas, we drink beer, there's potassium, right? This, this is, it's, it's a constant factor of life. Uh, it has fantastic uh, applications. If you, God forbid, but anybody also in the audience, if you have uh, a, a loved one who is suffering from cancer, right? Radiation therapy is saving lives. So, so it's about the dose. Yes, but right? you don't want to be ex exposed to a, a Hiroshima event, of course, God forbid, or something like that. But the idea that radiation is always and forever bad is just not true. We use it in all kinds of applications. Nuclear, the the discovery of nuclear fission in 1938. 
uh, in, in, in Berlin in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute was one of the greatest discoveries of, of humankind. Uh, and I think to deliberately and irrationally abandoning the potential uh, that's behind that technology would be a huge mistake. You just mentioned a very important word just a couple of minutes ago, you said clean. That's interesting because the, the EU just last year included nuclear energy among its uh, green energy sources in the new EU taxonomy. Does it mean nuclear can now be considered green? Or would the clean word be a better alternative? Well, let me throw the question back at you. Uh, what, apart from the label, it's a little bit unfair, so I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what do we mean by clean and green, right? I mean, these are, these are, these are terms that are, I have to admit in many ways are made up. To, to give you one example, there's this idea, for example, that, that solar panels, are, you know, that they are clean and green. Uh, again, I would recommend to everyone to look in the process of the, the production of a polysilicon, right? That's, that's one of the most energy intensive processes known to humankind. We basically take quartz sand and you have to melt it. Uh, and where is this done? It's done in China. And how do they do it? Through coal, because coal is their main source of energy to produce solar panels. Now, we don't do the thing in Europe, but we kind of do very you know, artistic and acrobatic emissions accounting that somehow we, we, we act or we pretend that all these quote unquote clean and green energy or electricity sources to be precise are super clean and have no impact. That is not true. Mining, I mean, we're going to talk about this in greater detail in the future, I'm sure, but the so-called clean energies need massive, massive amounts of mining. Just to give you one example, the International Energy Agency, this, these are official numbers, so this is not from some you know, right-wing fossil nuclear lobby group or something. Clean energies need about six times more minerals or rare earth minerals than other forms of energy production or and elect electricity production. Six times more. Now, where is that going to come from? It's coming from mines. Now, what do you need in order to run a mine? Mostly, you need fossil fuels, you need labor, you need technology. And of course, all of this is, is producing emissions. I mean, to give you uh, kind of an, another example about this, and because this is going to be such a big topic in the future, we tend to underestimate this. The, there, there is what is called the, the iron law of, of degrading ore purity, which means that, that, for example, if you want copper, if you want zinc, if you want these things, uh, we now have to dig much deeper, right? The refining process is much more energy intensive to actually get the resources, the minerals we want. So if we want more of them, right, we have to intensify this even more. So we'll need even more energy. And this brings me back to what I said at the very beginning of our conversation. The energy transition needs a huge upfront investment of energy. And of course, that energy will, not, will then not be there for something else. So this, this is, it is a, a blatant lie to claim that we can keep our living standards, abandon nuclear, abandon, abandon oil, abandon coal, abandon all of this, put up some, some windmills, put up some uh, wind turbines, put up some solar panels, and life is just going to continue the way it is, or it's gonna, even going to be better. It is, as I said before, it's like somebody telling you, uh, you no longer will have the mammoth, you no longer will have the rabbit, you're just going to have the handful of berries, but you'll be happy about it. They can tell you that, but you won't be, and I think this is something where all sensible people have to push against. And uh, before, before we unravel all this to the alternative sources, because um, solar, solar energy and, uh, and wind especially, they are the, the big stars today. I think, it's, um, I think there's no real political disagreement between the sides that we eventually need to pivot away from fossil fuels. But yeah, what we disagree about is what we should replace them. So what's... Uh, can, can you tell me a bit more about um, renewable energy in comparison with nuclear? Let me, uh, let me tell you what I believe the correct position is. Um, because this is what I sometimes hear is, oh, Ralph, you're, you know, you're a shill for the fossil fuel industry. You're a shill for the, for the nuclear industry. You are a, 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 an oil and gas lobbyist. I'm not, but if anybody watches this, uh, I'll, I'll, be, you know, I'll be open for business, so, so, so if, you know, if, if Exxon Mobile or Shell is looking at this, I'll, I'll be happy to, to start talks. But for me, is what I'm kind of promoting, or my big thing is, I'm promoting for a world of energy abundance. And promoting energy abundance is for me a little bit like promoting oxygen. Right? You, you can say, I don't need oxygen, I can hold my breath for, you know, for a minute. 
And next year, I'm going to hold my breath for two minutes. And the year after, I'm going to hold it for five minutes. And in 10 years, I can hold my breath forever and never going to need oxygen again. Because this is, in a nutshell, what the proponents of the energy transition try to tell you. Now, as I said, you might can hold your breath a minute. But that is not an indicator that you will ever be capable of living without oxygen forever. And it's the same in the energy transition. Yes, we will replace certain parts of fossil fuels uh, with solar where it's possible. And I'm a fan of it, right? I'm, I said, I'm an energy proponent. I want as much energy as possible because, as I said before, I don't necessarily want to give up the berries and just have mammoth. I want all of it. I want the berries, I want the mammoth, and I want the rabbit. And it's the same with energy. But if somebody tells you, you don't need the fossil fuels, you don't need nuclear, it's just enough to have the wind turbines and to have the solar panels, then you are back at the berry-only diet. And it doesn't matter how much, you know, how strongly they push for it, because we see it with energy prices. The energy transition has not made anywhere in the world, or the transition to renewables, has not made electricity bills or generally energy costs cheaper for anyone. We live in this absurd world where every work in Germany, for example, particularly, everyone is complaining about high energy prices and the political class or parts of the political class that push for this energy transition are pretty much putting their fingers in their ears and saying, nah, 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 I can't hear you. Uh, it's, it's, what, what are we supposed to do about this? You have a company that says, our energy bills are too high. And then you have politicians that go out there from, you know, from Portugal to the United Kingdom and say, renewables are the cheapest thing there is. Well, if it is, then why don't we see the results? Because they aren't, they aren't. And, and the point here again is not to say that, that they are bad. The point is to say that they will not suffice. And let me give you another example. We can, because we have the numbers for all of this. We started our conversation with Prometheus, right? And, and, and the flame he gave to humanity um, and, and the burning of wood. At this point of our speaking, humanity is using more biomass or wood right, for the production of energy than ever before. So we, we didn't even manage to transition away from wood. Uh, and now we say that the 80% of energy in, in the world that comes from, from fossil fuels, we're going to transition away from those 80% in the next, they say, you know, 2030, 2035, 2040. So in the next 20 years, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen, but I'm telling you what's going to happen. And this is, again, I think where the people should, should listen very carefully. We will pursue a policy as if we will not invest enough in nuclear for electricity. We will not invest enough upstream in, uh, in oil. We will not invest enough in gas. So we are heading for a new energy crisis that I believe, and we can have this conversation again in two or three years. I think we, we're going to head to an energy crisis we haven't seen. Because the idea, and I see this in all these reports, all these reports claim governments have planned to do this, governments have to plan to do this, so they will do this, they will do that. There are books, bookshelves, libraries, filled with articles about policy failures. Why does anybody believe if the government says in 10 years we will no longer need fossil fuels? Why would anybody believe them? Governments say all kinds of things all the time, and good for them, right? Politicians are populists, all of them, doesn't matter if it's left or right. So they all just say what they think the audience wants to hear. But the laws of physics don't care about populism. And it goes back to what I said before. If you don't build the trap for the rabbit, if you don't build the trap for the mammoth, you won't have rabbit, you won't have mammoth, you're going to be stuck with your berries. But the question is, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this as well, will people be satisfied with this? Because they are promised the mammoth and the rabbit. And then all of a sudden it turns out that all they can have, except for those on the higher up levels who can afford it, who can still afford it. They are the only ones who are gonna have the, you know, the fine meat and you'll be stuck with the, the, you know, the, the green poisonous berries. I'm not sure that most people will go along with this. Well, I'm, I'm very curious about that too, especially that you mentioned Germany, one of the most developed nations in Europe. How does it happen that Germany closes almost 40? It was 40 nuclear power plants in the last couple of decades. It, it, yeah. Yeah, the reactors, yes, but it was about 17, 17 power plants, but you're correct, yeah. How does it happen? And um, I'm sure that you living in Vienna, uh, you have a lot of connections with Germans. What does the average German think about that? Well, the good news is, I'm glad you asked this, the good news is that they have changed their position. Right now, a majority of Germans actually is in favor of nuclear power. But of course, we'll see. Hopefully, it's not too late. There's, there's some hope that you can reconnect the, the power plants. But this was an ideological victory by green and environmental groups who, in my opinion, and I'm going out on a limb here, but I think in the 1970s, uh, or maybe a, a little bit earlier and a little bit later, 
on the political left, uh, particularly on the environmental left, a kind of Malthusian uh, ideology took hold. So, so they, honest, and I think many of them still do, right? They believe that human beings are the problem on the planet. There are too many human beings, so we must find ways to reduce the global population, uh, which is why they have always, always, this is why they always have been opposed to nuclear energy, why they've always been opposed to kind of find ways and means, also including modern agriculture, ways it means to feed more people, because they don't want more people. I, un I sincerely believe this. I think there is a movement that is part on the left who thinks, which is, I would argue, in a quasi-religious uh, sense who believe kind of that humanity has to atone for the sins of its past, that you know Mother Gaia needs to be appeased and therefore we must sacrifice one, two, three or four billion. I honestly believe this and I can tell you why I do. Um, the biggest problem uh, a continent of Africa has is lack of access to energy. Uh, about 65% of unused <clears throat> agricultural land on the globe is in Africa. The continent of Africa alone, the continent of Africa alone, uh, under the right conditions and with the right technology could feed 9 billion people. So that continent, hypothetically alone, could feed the world. But for whatever reason, the West and others are trying everything they can to prevent Africa from moving into modernity, from industrializing, from urbanizing. We prevent it with everything we can. Uh, and this tells me, right, that there's something else at play. But let me tell you something else, which I find ironic in many ways. One of the issues that's very important for, for conservatives, but also very important for, for people on the left, uh, is the, the matter of migration, right? It's the idea of open borders. Now, just to give you one example, I, I hope I have the numbers right. So, so if anybody sees this, please correct me, but I think I'm almost, uh, I'm almost right. If you have somebody from Afghanistan, like moving to the United States, immediately the energy footprint of the person moving from Afghanistan to, to the United States increases by a factor of 12. So the, 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 the Afghani in Afghanistan simply does not have the same access to the kind of energy that he has in the United States, which of course also means that emissions go up by a similar factor, right? That the CO2 footprint is going up by that factor. So the same people who very often claim that they care about the planet so much, but also say that they care about, you know, that they want open borders and, and immigration, all these kind of things, must know that those two things are not working together, right? If you have people moving from, from, from less energy intensive societies to more energy intensive societies, they will also use more energy. And the other thing is, which is also important, the last point on this, just real quick, the pro because this is the big irony, which I enjoy so much. It is not so much population growth that is, uh, that, that is causing emissions to go up. It's urbanization, right? The, the, the real areas where, where, where you have energy kind of almost pulsating with energy are urban centers. That's where the steel is, that's where concrete is, right? This is where the machinery is. This is really where energy intensity is the highest. And the big irony is, where do the environmentalists and the green parties have their voting base? They have them all in the urban centers. So the very people who constantly talk about the importance of, you know, the you know, uh, untouched nature are the ones who live in like the high energy and high resource intensive areas. So there is something going on that, that is not, in my opinion, fully explainable by rationality. This has become an ersatz religion, right? This has become an ideology and this makes it so dangerous. Uh, and, and this is, I think, why there needs to be, at some point at least, a counter movement, a pro-energy movement. As I said, I'm not against renewables, I'm not against preserving the environment, none of this. But I'm pro-energy because I think if the access of society to energy decreases, so will their living standards. And I want people to have high living standards. And I'm not talking about, sorry, this is my last part of this monologue, but this is, so I don't want them, you know, I'm not talking about luxury. I'm talking about things like a health system. People do not understand or they underestimate the amount of energy that's needed in a hospital, the amount of energy needed to produce the equipment needed in a hospital. Like this is something, again, people think you go into a hospital and there's an MRI, right? And there are all these, these, these uh, tools made out of plastic and all these, these scalpels, right? these, these very, very fine, very hard to produce um, uh, things you need to, to uh, conduct medical procedures. That comes from somewhere. If we make energy unaffordable, we make healthcare unaffordable. I don't want to live in such a world, right? I don't want to live in a world where people die because they can't afford it, but this is ultimately what the outcome could be. And um, do you also think that this movement of yours, if we could theoretically start it, uh, how do you think we could attract 
all the environmentally inclined people, all the people who really think that saving the environment is number one priority, uh, stopping climate change is number one priority. Because as you said, um, focusing only on renewables is almost like a counter movement to that, almost like a, yeah. a counter step. So do you think eventually we could tell people that if you really want to save the environment, if you re really want to reverse climate change, nuclear or a diverse portfolio think, of energy yes. is, is the way I to think go. Precisely. I think that's I think that's the key point. A diverse portfolio, right? It's, it's also good for energy security. You want you don't want to put all your eggs into one basket. So you want to diversify, yes. I guess what I mean is that um, this water base is completely dominated by a sort of green agenda, mm -hmm. which doesn't really let any kind of different views into, uh, into its, its, its narratives. How do you, how do you um, crack that open and tell these people that, look, it's, it's, these people are not going to save the planet. These people just want to vote. I think the, the probably one of the most important steps would be to do it in education. And, and I'm not talking about something highly complex, but just kind of to, to very, really ask, as, as we did in this conversation, to ask people, you know, look around you. Look around everything there is. You know, the, the TV on the screen, the walls, right? You know, the, the asphalt on the, on the street, the concrete, the steel in the buildings, like, you know, the paper on the table. Look at all of this and then say, where do you think this comes from? Where do you think these things come from? Do they fall from heaven? Is it like, you know, like, it, does it magically appear? And I think if you create the consciousness that all of this has a starting point somewhere, and as I said before, that starting point is abundant energy. If, I think if people realize this, and, if, and, and they, I think intuitively they know it. Like intuitive people know that all the things that we see around us are not just there. Right? They see that there, there is something behind it. And I think to create a consciousness again that everything comes from somewhere, I think this would be the, the kind of this would be the most the most crucial step. And there is no, let me say this as forcefully as I can. The energy sector is the one sector that enables all other sectors. There is without energy, there is no modern agriculture without 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 energy. There is no production of anything without energy. There is nothing without energy. We are back, and I don't want to overstretch this comparison, but it is. We are back to the hunter gatherer. Now, some people will probably enjoy this. Okay, granted, if, if this is if this is your life model, but if this, then you go for it, man. I'm all, I'm all, I'm all there for it. Uh, but it's not my choice, right? I want I like it. I want a refrigerator. Right? I want uh, uh, hot showers. Uh, I want heating in the winter. I like all of these things. And I know, I know many people say, but what about efficiency? Just because this, this, this number is really important for me. We got more efficient. A modern refrigerator needs less electricity than an old one. But here's the thing. The amount of energy needed to produce $1 of GDP since the 1990s has declined by 36%. That's awesome. We really got more efficient by over a third. But the overall energy use increased by 63%. Because here's the thing, every bit of energy that gets freed up will be used somewhere. So you're correct, right? We no longer have you know, these, these, these electricity sucking refrigerators. But of course, now we have cloud computing, right? Now we have vast networks. We have artificial intelligence. The digital technologies, cloud computing, the internet is already using almost a quarter of the global electricity production. Thereabouts. So, so the, the, once again, everything is connected to the matter of energy. And this is, as I always say, and the reason why I'm a proponent of nuclear is because it is not the only, but it is one of the best methods to give us, to provide us with that energy at a low price. And if it comes at a low price, it will be affordable for millions and billions of people. And I find that's a beautiful vision, right? There's nothing, the, 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 the idea of energy abundance is a vision of human prosperity. It's a vision of human flourishing. And I think that is something we really should, and again, I'm not talking about massive luxury. I'm talking about a dignified life for billions and billions of people. And those who tell you that this is not possible, or there are already too many people, and therefore right, we should not use the technologies we have, that's, and I say this provocatively, but deliberately, that's a genocidal mindset. If I know, if you have a family, and I would have the tools to, extend your family's life expectancy to make sure that your wife is not going to die in childbirth, right? That you don't have to burn dung and wood uh, and, and dig out coal by hand as they have to do in areas of India to heat your home, which causes horrible indoor pollution, which causes cancer and all these things. If I deliberately prevent you from getting technology that would prevent you 
from, from not having to suffer through these, through these negative consequences. I argue you pursue a, a quasi-genocidal policy. I could save lives, I could make people's lives better, and I say I don't because I want to save the planet. Okay, fine enough. I don't think it's going to save the planet because will people go along with this? Will the people in India, in China, in Africa, will they remain poor just to satisfy the dreams of a Western rich elite? They won't. So I say better support them to get there quick than to, get that, to, get, to let them get there slow and dirtier. Everybody's burning coal again. Like this is one of the big surprises. It was not a surprise for those who know how the commodity market works. The big comeback of 2022 was coal. We burn more coal than ever. And we were told 20 years ago that the time of coal is over. People need energy. They will not accept if, if, if Germany tells them you can't have it. They will get it from somewhere. And they will, if, if, if the worst comes, comes to pass, right, they will fight for it if need be. And I think we entirely underestimate the risks that are, that are accumulating here. That's the other parts of the world and completely logical as a consequence of the energy crisis and the war. But what's happening, uh, what I'm curious about is what ha what's happening in Europe. And hypothetically, let's imagine a future 2030, 2040, 2050, if, if uh, the EU fulfills its dream of uh, complete green energy, completely phased out uh, fossil fuels and not enough nuclear. So what do you think? the uh, green transformation really would look like for the average European? If it would happen the way you just described it, uh, let me put it in a couple of bullet points. One is without energy, you don't have industry. Without industry, you don't have prosperity. And without prosperity, you have poverty. But will people voluntarily accept the move from wealth to prosperity? I don't think so. There is a, a, a somebody whom I admire very much once said that on the path from abundance to scarcity is riot and revolution. And I think that is very true, uh, that if the European Union, if European politicians really want to force this down their the people's throat, they will look for parties uh, that look at this issue uh, differently. Then, and we already see this happening, right? Then they probably will try to ban those parties. And at some point, people will air those grievances otherwise. Uh, just to give you one quick example of this, over the last couple of years, the world has never spent as much money on food and uh, fuel subsidies as they did over the last 24 months, because every government knows. They know it in the poor countries where the situation is, is, is uh, more serious than here. You know, if people cannot feed their families, if people cannot heat their homes, they will riot. Because if you have nothing to lose, what else are you going to do? And if European politicians think, that Europeans will not go out in the streets if they can no longer afford to heat, if they no longer have good paying jobs, if they see their life savings disappear in a hyperinflationary pressures, because that is, that's another point, just real quick, if I may. Uh, you cannot print or inflate an energy scarcely away. If there is no gas, there is no gas. It doesn't matter how much money the government wants to throw at it. Right? It's just not there. So people will write, we are creating, as a consequence, of the energy policy pre-revolutionary conditions in Europe. But let me make one final statement that I think is really important. Because everybody who listens to this is probably going to say, oh, that sounds like a very technical topic, like a very ideological technical topic. And it is. It's a cultural issue. And what I mean by this is the risks that are currently coming together are the consequences of deliberate political decisions. It wouldn't have to be this way. So there is no iron law that says that energy poverty or an energy crisis must be at the end of the road. These are political decisions. And I think the sooner the, 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 the well-meaning, the smart hats, the smart forces in Europe get together and say, we need to push back against this, the better it is going to be. So let me again, very clear about this. This is not the laws of physics do not demand a shortage of energy. It's the, if you, if you want, it's the laws of politics. We have been, or some of us, we have been asleep at the wheel. <coughs> we have allowed the anti-humanist Malthusians to take over and push for their <coughs> quasi-genocidal programs. And I think now it is time to push back. I think this was a marvelous uh, last <coughs> sentence <coughs> and so final point. Uh, thank you for joining us in the European Conservative. And uh, viewers can find your report and other materials down in the description. And for news analyses and other uh, video audio content visit the europeanconservative.com